favors gives favorable media treatment to certain uh, candidates, no? Right? Like, for example, in the last campaign, who would you say was most favored? Calderon, yeah? And so they're wondering what you think of... It seems to be happening across the board in many nations around the world, and um, obviously you've noticed what's been going on with uh, Ron Paul and uh, how the media doesn't really favorably treat him. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, uh, I mean, the electoral process, you know, as far as my country, I can't speak for others, but the electoral process here is, I mean, it's it's like the most complicated math problem you will ever try to figure out. Uh, the way that they use the electoral college and the popular vote and the delegate vote and everything else, it's, you know, it's so confusing at times that that we don't even understand when, when there's an over, you know, uh, a huge number of people crying out for support of one person, yet, uh, you know, they're, well, they didn't get the most populated county, or they, uh, you know, they only received this many delegates, or, well, we're using the electoral college system, and this state only gets so many, uh, you know, electoral votes, and it just, uh, it, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, it should be, and this is, of course, just my opinion, but it should just be, uh, you know, hey, the entire country makes a vote, and they count all the votes at the end, and whoever has the most is the winner. I mean, that would seem like uh, an obvious, rational choice. This is what happened to Al Gore, right? But then uh, he lost that one. And we know we they've got those Diebold machines, right? So that's something to watch oh, yeah. out for. Oh, yeah. Um, and he should, and Al Gore should have won that election. I mean, and, and we all know it, whether you support Al Gore or not. You know, uh, he was... Uh, he was definitely cheated and embezzled out of that election, and it's you know that's not you know American democracy. Right, I'm no fan of Gore, but he I, yeah. I would guess that he won that he, one. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what what are the opinions of some of your uh, colleagues? You mentioned some are you know warmongering. I have uh, friends and family also that um, have served or are currently serving. Um, I mean, do you, do you see a diverging opinion, or is there still this kind of monolithic opinion of people in the service? Because I know Ron Paul has the largest support out of all of the candidates, and I don't know if that's like two times over or something. Yeah, yeah. as far as military support, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, and actually, just to touch on that real quick, uh, February 20th in Washington, D.C., there is a rally for Ron Paul. By veterans, and uh, it's uh, basically it's uh, Ron Paul is the choice of troops rally on March on uh, it's a march on Washington D.C. and we have already thousands of people that are already expected to be there. Uh, a couple uh, bands that are playing there. I mean, it's going to be a huge event, and I'll be speaking there at the Washington Monument. And uh, but yeah, he does have a lot of support of the troops because. Uh, when he speaks to us, we understand what he's saying. We and we hear that he's not going to be hurting us. That he's not going to be taking money out of the pockets of the of the soldiers and the families that actually need it, but instead taking money out of the pockets of the of the corporate interests that have uh, you know interest in in the Defense Department. And um, and what was the first part of your, oh, as far as uh, other soldiers, yeah, uh, you know. It, it changes, you know, I, I mean, obviously right after 9-11, everybody was like, let's go get them. And, and a lot of people bought into what the media was saying. You know, I can't tell you how many times uh, President George Bush said uh, terrorists, weapons of mass destruction, you know, uh, you know, and, and to basically instill this idea into American people, just like the, it's a propaganda war, just like they're doing today with Iran. Most people don't even hear the word Iran without thinking nuclear weapons and Islamic radicals. And it's, uh, you know, it's just a propaganda thing. Uh, but a lot of soldiers after, I mean, hell, after a decade of war, we're, you know, they're starting to come around. They're starting to look at different things. They're starting to say, wait a minute, you know, we've, we've been here. What are we doing here anymore? And, uh, you know, the, the, the most sad thing to me, like I said, is when I've talked to my friends and, my uh, other people in my unit who have served in Iraq, and they say, well, we don't, I say, hey, now that the war is over, now that we've pulled out of Iraq, you know, uh, mission complete, do you feel like what you did over there was a success? Do you feel like what you did was good? Do you feel like 
everybody we lost over there was worth it. And I can't tell you how many people look at me and say, I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, I don't I don't think we did anything over there. You know, and, and it's sad because these people fought and died and bled, you know, in, in response to what their nation asked them to do. And they're coming home and they don't even know what what they've done and if they did the right thing. Any other questions so far that comes to mind? No? You got a really um, quiet class, huh? They sleep on they yeah. sleep your class or what? Sometimes they're 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 uh, a bit shy, especially when it camera shy, I guess you can say. Hey. And as as well, English is their second language, so sometimes. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I understand, man. <laughs> well, you got you got what ten, twelve of you. I'm the only one on this side of the screen. Okay, how do you think I feel? <laughs> um, what do you think? Who do you think are the movers and shakers largely behind policy? Um, I don't know if you've heard of groups like. Uh, Bilderberg, I know um, Ron Paul has spoken against such groups. Um, who do you think are the movers and shakers behind policy? I mean, to a degree, there's you know what we see on TV. Um, and what's your opinion? Have you done any research? Uh, to that well, I, uh, you know, I, I think that it, as far as on the policy side of it, you know, the movers and shakers come directly from the administration that's in charge whether they want to be responsible for that or not. Uh, you know, just like, for example, Barack Obama, he appointed, uh, you know, a chief of staff, he appointed a cabinet, he appointed advisors, and those people are the ones that are telling him, this is what we want you to do. But ultimately, the biggest movers and shakers are, are the major corporations that have the money to say, hey, if you do, if you do this, we'll do this, and uh, you know, even even today, right now, there's uh, a big controversial thing going on about, uh, you know, them, the, the federal government mandating that, uh, you know, Catholic hospitals and stuff like that must must uh, be able to issue birth control and and the morning after pill and which is obviously trampling on their First Amendment rights to religious freedom, you know, going against what they believe in ethically and morally. But but when it comes down to it, the mover and shaker behind that is the FDAA, because the U.S. government, the Federal Drug Administration, is the biggest drug dealer in the entire world. Pablo Escobar doesn't have anything on the FDA, you know? Statistically, that's true, yeah. I know. Um. What can you tell us? What else can you tell us about uh, the average day in the life of an uh, active soldier in? Af Where did you serve in Afghanistan? You said. Oh uh, yeah, I was in Afghanistan. I mean, as much as you can tell us, um, without going into any great detail. I mean, what what's the average uh, day in the life of a soldier out there? Well, you know, it's the most exciting, boring thing you'll ever do in your life. Uh, you know, there's a lot of days where nothing happens, and there's some days where everything happens. And, uh, you know, there's there's several things that pop out in my mind. Uh, I remember a man coming to our base with his two children, and uh, they had third-degree burns all over them. And, and one, the little girl had brain matter, matter exposed, and it was, uh, you know, it was horrific. And... Uh, you know, I just remember thinking how horrible that was. And, and even as he was standing there and our army medics were working on his children, he was asking us for food and water, you know, and uh, it just goes to show the that the people have over there. Um, you know, uh, like, like you said, I really can't get into too much detail, obviously for operational security purposes, but uh, you know, it's there's a, like I said, there's a lot of times where you do nothing. You sit around in your rack all day. You you uh, burn your own feces, and you you know uh, you just do nothing. You work out, and then there's some days where you're on patrols and you're running missions, and you know it's, it's like everything's happening all at once, and you're not getting much sleep. But uh, you know, all in all, it's it's horrible. I <laughs> I wouldn't recommend anybody go over there. Um, another question was, uh, could you describe the moment um, where, that, and 
where it led up to you to your decision of thinking that you know the best idea would be to bring the troops home like well, where, where was this sort of turning point where I mean you, you said you followed Ron Paul and and his beliefs for a while when when did this turning point happen for you well you know uh, Congress passed excuse me Congress passed resolution in 2001 to go after the Taliban or excuse me al-qaeda and uh, anyone responsible for the 9/11 attacks including people that harbored them etc so uh, you know and I was all about that I thought yeah that's that's exactly what needs to happen now mind you that most uh, people that were responsible for 9/11 the actual hijackers were mostly Saudi Arabian but regardless uh, you know, the finger was pointed at Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, so we went after them. And uh, you know, I think that that was responsible. That's what needed to happen. But ten years later, you know, we're not fighting, you know, Osama bin Laden anymore. He's dead. We're, you know, the Secretary of Defense came out and said there's only 50 to 100 Al Qaeda members in the entire country of Afghanistan. Yet we have 70,000 troops deployed there. Um, so. You know, it started to sink into my head that, hey, we're, we're not here anymore because of, you know, what happened on 9-11. You know, we're here for a totally different reason. And that reason is a pipeline. I mean, there is a pipeline that's being built through Afghanistan. It goes from Turkmenistan to Afghanistan, through Pakistan and to India. And it started in 1995 through an American company called Unical. And... Uh, in 1998, there was a couple embassies bombed in Afghanistan, and Unicol pulled out of the deal. And three years later, we're going to war with Afghanistan. And, and in 2003, they restarted the pipeline, and the pipeline is back going again, which just coincidentally, by the way, happens to bypass the Straits of Hormuz. I thought that was a little interesting. But, uh, you know, and, and as far as Iraq, you know, they said, oh, uh, you know, we're weapons of mass destruction and weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, we never found any weapons of mass destruction. And, uh, you know, either A, they know that they have them because we gave them to them, or B, uh, you know, that it was just a propaganda to try to get us over there. Uh, you know, it, right now, it seems like the entire world is placing their pieces, their political pieces on the world chessboard to try to secure oil and secure energy and to get strongholds in certain areas of the world. And, uh, you know, I don't want to be any part of that. When I, you know, I I did make an oath to support the French Constitution, and I did make an oath to defend the United States against enemies foreign and domestic. But the key word there is defend. I didn't say I was going to be, a, you know, an offensive tool that, that just invades country after country. And I think more and more people are starting to realize that that's why you're seeing such an outcry of support for a candidate like Ron Paul. You know, he's run a couple other times before and didn't have near the success he did today. But his message is starting to get out there more loud and clear, and people are starting to wake up and say, uh, you know, there's some things that are going on that aren't right. I think the last time I looked over the UN reports uh, on drugs, they said over 90% of Heroin comes out of Afghanistan, so that's it does. another. It does. I've seen poppy fields, huge poppy fields, and I've seen uh, marijuana fields, huge ones. Uh, not that I'm particularly as against uh, marijuana for medical purposes, but poppy fields, you know, I mean, they, they need to be destroyed. And poppy fields have actually been on the rise and increased since the American invasion. So, you know, what does that say? Yeah, that's uh, another interesting point. Um, you guys have any other questions come to mind? Okay, so how do the Afghanis perceive the whole situation? Do they do they um, believe what the West says? I, 